Chapter 6, The Mind, Part 2. The early groundwork for the revolution was laid in the 19th century by physicians who noticed that injuries to certain parts of the brain result in special kinds of disability. Perhaps the famous case was that of Phineas P. Gage, who in 1848 was a young construction foreman in charge of a crew laying railroad track across Vermont. Part of the job was to blast away outcrops of hard rock in order to straighten out turns in the advancing path of the track, the railroad track. As Gage pressed power into a newly drilled hole, a premature explosion fired the iron tamping bar like a missile toward his head. It entered his left cheek and exited the top of his skull carrying with it a good part of the prefrontal lobe of his cerebral cortex, then arced away more than a hundred feet before coming to earth. Gage fell to the ground, miraculously still alive. To the amazement of all, he was able within minutes to sit up and even walk with assistance. He never lost consciousness. Wonderful accident was the later headline in the Vermont Mercury. In time, his external injuries healed and he retained the ability to speak and reason, but his personality had changed drastically. Where previously he had been cheerful, responsible, and well-mannered, a valued employee of the Rutland and Burlington Railroad, now he was a habitual liar, unreliable at suggested by Gage's misfortune. The prefrontal lobe houses centers important for initiative and emotional balance. For two centuries, the medical archives have filled with such anecdotes on the effects of localized brain damage. The data have made it possible for neurologists to piece together a map of functions performed by different parts of the brain. The injuries which occur throughout the brain include physical traumas, strokes, tumors, infections, and poisoning. They vary in extent from barely detectable pinpoints to deletions and transections of large parts of the brain. Depending on load and magnitude, they have multifarious effects on thought and behavior. The most celebrated recent case is that of Karen Ann Quinlan. On April 14, 1975, the young New Jersey woman, while dosed with the tranquilizer Valium and painkiller drug Darvon, made the mistake of drinking gin and tonic. Although the combination does not sound dangerous, it essentially killed Karen Ann Quinlan. She fell into a coma that lasted until her death from massive infections 10 years later. An autopsy revealed that her brain was largely intact which explains why her body survived and even continued its daily cycle of waking and sleep. It lived on even when Quinlan's parents arranged in the midst of a national controversy to have her ventilator removed. The autopsy revealed that Quinlan's brain damage was local, but very severe. The thalamus had been obliterated as though burned out with a laser. Why that particular center deteriorated is unknown. A brain injured by a heavy blow or certain forms of poisoning usually responds by widespread swelling. If the reaction is intense, it presses on centers that control heartbeat and respiration, shutting down blood circulation and soon ending in death of the whole body. The result of thalamus excision alone is brain death, or more precisely put, mind death. The thalamus comprises twin egg-shaped masses of nerve cells near the center of the brain. It functions as a relay center through which all sensory information other than smell is transmitted to the cerebral cortex and therefore to the conscious mind. Even dreams are triggered by impulses that pass through thalamic circuits. Quinlan's drug accident was the equivalent of blowing up a power station. All her lights down line went out and she entered a sleep from which she had no chance of awakening. Her cerebral cortex lived on 
waiting to be activated. But consciousness, even in dreams, was no longer possible. Such research on brain damage, while enormously informative, is nevertheless dependent on chance occurrence. Over the years, it has been greatly enhanced by experimental brain surgery. Neurosurgeons routinely keep patients conscious to test their response to electrical stimulation of the cortex in order to locate healthy tissue and avoid excising it. The procedure is not uncomfortable. Brain tissue, while processing impulses from all over the body, has no receptors of its own. Instead of pain, the roving probes evoke a medley of sensations and muscular contractions. When certain sites on the surface of the cortex are stimulated, patients experience images, melodies, incoherent sounds, and a gamut of other impressions. Sometimes they involuntarily move fingers and other body parts. Beginning with experiments in brain surgery by Wilder Penfield and other pioneers in the 1920s and 30s, researchers have mapped sensory and motor functions over all parts of the cerebral cortex. The method is nevertheless limited in two important respects. It is not easily extended beneath the cortex into the dark nether regions of the brain, and it cannot be used to reach these objectives, to create motion pictures of the whole brain in action, scientists have adopted a broad range of sophisticated techniques borrowed from physics and chemistry. Since its inception in the 1970s, brain imaging, as them are collectively called, has followed a trajectory similar to that of microscopy, toward ever finer resolution in snapshots separated by shrinking intervals of time. The sign eventually to monitor the activity of entire networks of individual nerve cells, both continuously and throughout the living brain. Again, this is 21 years ago, so we know now imaging is far more advanced. <laughs> Granted, the brain's machinery remains forbiddingly alien, and scientists have traced only a minute fraction of its circuitry. Still, the major anatomical features of the brain are known, and a great deal has been learned of their various functions. Trolling. Biochemists marvel at the exactitude and power of the enzyme cells. Like the mills of God, the processes of evolution grind slowly, yet, as the poet said, they grind exceeding fine. So let us spread the specification sheets out and consider the brain as a solution to a set of physical problems. It is best to start with simple geometry because a huge amount of circuitry is required and the wiring elements must be built from living cells. A relatively huge mass of new tissue needs to be manufactured and housed in the brain case. The ideal brain case will be spherical or close to it. One compelling reason is that a sphere has the smallest surface relative to volume of any geometric form and hence provides the least access to its vulnerable interior. Another reason is that a sphere allows more circuits to be placed close together. The average length of circuits can uh, thus be minimized, raising the speed of transmission while lowering the energy cost for their construction and maintenance. Because the basic units of the brain machine must be made of cells, it is best to stretch these elements out into string-shaped forms that serve simultaneously as receiving stations and coaxial cables. The dual-purpose cells created by evolution are in fact the neurons, also called nerve cells or nerve fibers. It is further practical to design the neurons so that their main bodies serve as the receiving sites for impulses from other cells. The neurons can send their own cells out along axons, cable-like extensions of the cell bodies. For speed, make the transmission neurons are then said to fire. For accuracy, during neuron firing, surround the axons with insulating sheaths. These, in fact, exist as white white fatty myelin membranes that together give the brain its light color. To achieve a higher level of integration, the brain must be very intricately and precisely wired. Given again that its elements are living cells, 
the number of neuron connections are best multiplied by growing thread-like extensions from the tips of the axons, which reach out and transmit individually to the bodies of many other cells. The discharge of the axon travels to these multiple terminal extensions all the way to their tips, which then make contact with the receptor cells. The receptor cells accept some of the tips of the terminal axon branches on the surface of their main cell bodies. They accept other tips in their dendrites, which are thread-like receptor branches growing out from the cell bodies. Now visualize the entire nerve cell as a miniature squid. From its body sprouts a cluster of tentacles, the dendrites. One tentacle, the axon, is much longer than the others, and from its tip it sprouts more tentacles. The message is received on the body and short tentacles of the squid, and travels along the long tentacle to other squids. The brain comprises the equivalent of 100 billion squids linked together. The cell-to-cell -cell connections, more precisely the points of connection and the ultra-microscopic spaces separating them, are called synapses. I'll read that again. The cell-to-cell -cell connections, more precisely the points of connection and the ultra-microscopic spaces separating the points of connection, are called synapses. When an electric discharge reaches a synapse, it induces the tip of the terminal branch to release a neurotransmitter, a chemical that either excites an electric discharge in the receiving cell or prevents one from occurring. Each nerve cell sends signals to hundreds or thousands of other cells through its synapses at the end of its axon, and it receives input from a similar myriad of synapses on its main cell body and dendrites. In each instant, a nerve cell either fires an impulse along its axon to other cells or falls silent. Which of the two responses it makes depends on the summation of the neurotransmissions received from all the cells that feed stimuli into it. The activity of the brain as a whole, hence the wakefulness and moods experienced by the conscious mind, is profoundly affected by the levels of the neurotransmitters that wash its trillions of synapses. Among the most important of the neurotransmitters are acetylcholine and the amines or amines, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Others include the amino acid GABA, that's gamma aminobutyric acid, and surprisingly, the elementary gas nitrous oxide. Some neurotransmitters excite the neurons they contact, while others inhibit them. Still others can exert either effect, depending on the location of the circuit, within the nervous system. During development of the nervous system in the fetus and infant, the neurons extend their axons and dendrites into the cellular environment, like growing tentacles of squids. The connections they make are precisely programmed and guided to their destinations by chemical cues. Once in place, each neuron is poised to play a special role in signal transmission. Its axon may stretch only a few millionths of a meter or thousands of times longer. Its dendrites and terminal axon branches can take any of a number of forms, coming to resemble, say, the leafless crown of a tree in winter or a dense felt-like mat. Possessing the aesthetic inherent to pure function and riveting to behold, they invite us to imagine their powers. Concerning them, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, the great Spanish histologist, wrote of his own experience after receiving the 1906 Nobel Prize for his research on the subject, quote, Like the entomologist in pursuit of brightly colored butterflies, my attention hunted in the flower garden of the gray matter, cells with delicate and elegant forms, the mysterious butterflies of the soul, the beatings of whose wings may some day, who knows, clarify of mental life. Close quote. The meaning of the neuron shape just is this.
Neuron systems are directed networks receiving and broadcasting in places forming a circle like a snake catching its own tail to create reverberating circuits. Each neuron is touched by the terminal axon branches of many other neurons, established by a kind of democratic vote whether it is to be active or silent. Using a Morse-like code of staccato firing, the cell sends its own messages outward to others. The number of connections made by the cell, their pattern of spread, and the code they use determine the role the cell plays in the overall activity of the brain. To complete the engineering metaphor, when you're setting out to design a hominid brain, it is important to observe another optimum design principle and emotional control centers identified thus far by neurobiologists. Nerve cell bodies are gathered in flat assemblages called layers and rounded ones called nuclei. Most are placed at or near the surface of the brain. They are interconnected by, both by their own axons and by intervening neurons that course through the deeper brain tissues. One result is the gray or light brown color of the surface due to the massing of the cell bodies, the gray matter of the color from the myelin sheaths of axons in the interior of the brain. Human beings may possess the most voluminous brain in proportion to body size of any large animal species that has ever lived. For a primate species, the human brain is evidently at or close to its physical limit. If it were much larger in the newborn, the passage of its protecting skull through the birth canal would be dangerous to both mother and child. Even the adult brain size is mechanically risky. The head is a fragile, internally liquescent globe balanced on a delicate bone and muscle stem within which the brain is vulnerable and the mind is easily stunned and disabled. Human beings are innately disposed to avoid violent physical contact. Because our evolving ancestors traded brute strength for intelligence, we no longer need to seize and rip enemies with fanged jaws. Given this intrinsic limit in brain volume, some way must be found to fit in the memory banks and higher order integrating systems needed to generate conscious thought. The only means available is to increase surface area, spread the cells out into a broad sheet and crumple it up into a ball. The human cerebral cortex is such a sheet, about 1,000 square inches in area, packed with millions of cell bodies per square inch, folded and wadded precisely like an origami into many winding ridges and fissures neatly stuffed in turn into the quart-sized cranial cavity. What more can be said of brain structure? Actually, we should stop there and pick this up next time because we're at a half hour. Uh, that was uh, chapter six, The Mind uh, from Consilience. This will be part two. Thanks for...